Hi, my name is Wes Delavola, founder of Meridian Treehouse, a Washington DC based strategic storytelling and experience innovation collaborative. I'm also the former director of live events and experiences for the National Geographic Society and currently a board member for the Hydras, an educational nonprofit focused on open access, access oceans <laughs> um, and have been using immersive experiences and media to help with that goal. But what I'm here to talk with you all about today um, is shared synchronized immersive reality experiences and what that meant for National Geographic at my time there. And that was building the world's largest permanent virtual reality theater. And that started with Grosvenor Auditorium at the National Geographic headquarters in Washington, DC. This 40 year old theater housed um, 100 plus events a year, uh, most of, you know, ranging from talks to film screenings to panel discussions. And then in 2018, <laughs> Um, became home to a shared virtual reality experience called VR Explorations. This experience brought together 450 Oculus Go headsets that were remote activated, synchronized, and integrated into a traditional talk with a speaker on stage with traditional video and photography. So really creating a fully immersive experience for 400 of you and your closest friends um, to enjoy with a National Geographic Explorer on stage. The process culminated with the opening of the theater on uh, October 10th, 2018, for our very first presentation with uh, photographer Aaron Huey, focused on the National Monument in the United States, Bears Ears National Monument. But before then, there were months and months and months of getting things ready. Um, first of which was securing the headsets and turning them on and loading them up and signing them in and getting them ready. And then beyond that, making sure that all 450 were set up properly and were working. And as you can see behind um, my colleague, Ben, Gar uh, ben from Spaces, um, there are those medical metal cages. So in creating the theater, of course, there's the headsets, the technology, the synchronized software, um, and all the things that make the tech run, but there's also the physical. Where do you store 450 headsets, charge them, make sure they're secure and have power uh, and can be easily accessible to the theater from backstage where we are currently in this picture. So figuring that out was a big concern, but we also still had headsets to continue to set up and test and more headsets, more headsets. Needless to say, I spent most of August, 2018 with my face in a headset, just like this. And then of course, with the headsets come the controllers. So that's 450 controllers. How does one keep them in order, well, a lot of um, label maker tape and patience. So each remote or sorry, controller, I called them remotes as the main system driver was called the controller, um, was numbered to match to corresponding number on a headset. And these were then stored in the cages that I just showed you for charging and safe storage. And of course there was activations. So that meant 450 headsets were deployed in the theater and we had to collect them sometimes with shows that had nothing but an hour in between them or were part of a day long festival where there was programming in 20 minutes. Thankfully, I had a really dynamic team, including Danielle Thompson, who's pictured here in the flower dress, who was my manager at the time, um, who was not afraid to get hands on with at least 20 headsets on her five foot three frame. So as I've explained this, I know I quickly ran through what the technology was, but the world's largest permanent virtual reality theater really at its heart was 450 64 gigabyte Oculus Go headsets connected together. Um, the content was pre-downloaded through the proprietary Unity based system um, that was able to remote control and synchronize the headsets and also push out content wirelessly to all 450 headsets. Um, it was also enabled ambisonic and stereoscopic 360 video to playback. Um, the system 
also included all those headsets and like all those cages to keep the headset safe. Um, there was also a dedicated server and mesh network with five channel access ports on site to support the activation and content download. Um, and we could also do all of this via three synchronized in the theater downstairs uh, at National Geographic and also a private screening room of 50. So the theater had an ancillary connection um, to power this invite only special theater. So after all of that, we had the VR Exploration Theater. And as you can see in this picture, um, we've got a speaker on stage, Felipe de Andrade, talking about sharks with 400 people ready to go swimming with him. And I have to say, it was pretty amazing to watch all the faces. So everyone you see in this picture is seeing the same thing at the same time and able to interact with each other, look around and engage, but also with the speaker on stage. So you can hear the audio through the headsets. You can also hear it over the theater speaker system as well. It really was a whole new way of storytelling. And I know everyone's looking in different directions, but that's because that's the fun of 360 video is you're able to look around and you get to be the director of your own adventure. So I know that this panel is really looking at how does this successful and make a profit for institutions and really a viable business model. The great thing about this is in the first 18 months, there were 10 virtual reality exploration experiences, all 10 sold out at a higher ticket price than any other event. We also received $150,000 grant to do research looking into the efficacy of VR. So the average uh, revenue per experience was nearly 13,000 US dollars. On average, our traditional events were in the $8,000 range. So really a 50%, a little bit more um, additional in revenue from the experiences. And that was 4,000 people, give or take, who <laughs> came in that first eight, those first 10 events to experience these uh, VR theater events. Um, we also won the Webby Award for Best VR Interaction Design um, and additional wins for the 360 components um, that were part of the National Geographic Collection, most often time created by Black Dot Films. Um, we also had three private events with the VR exploration uh, activations, and we had built 12 unique experiences that we could share with our audiences which could be replicated um, as we were slowly moving out of the prototyping phase of having 18 months under our belt. We were looking to expand and do regular weekly programming. Um, in fact, I had built a couple budgets that looked at how much money this theater could make us within a year doing repeating some of these experiences after they premiered. But I wasn't done <laughs> um, with just one theater there was a need to take the this experience mobile and take it to where people were, classrooms, um, co conventions, other convening events, uh, and the X Games, the side of a mountain in Aspen, Colorado. So in a self-contained kit um, that was powered by <laughs> a, a router that created a, a mesh network, didn't need any outside internet connection, 30 headsets, fully self-contained in two Pelican cases, could make this happen in a public school. Even the teachers loved it. Um, this teacher welcomed us into our room, welcomed us into her room for us to try out um, this experience with her students. Then we took it to the side of a mountain in Aspen, Colorado, and had 5,500 people in four days travel to Mount Everest with us and up to 12 people at a time in 20 degree weather on the side of a mountain, really taking VR anywhere um, and enabling this shared experience everywhere. Um, there were three expedition kit prototypes built before I left in March. Each kit had 30 headsets and was fully mobile, self-contained, required no outside inter internet connections. We had five successful deployments across two continents, one in a DC public school, one for the Royal Society in October 2019, uh, once at the American Geophysical F Union's fall meeting in San Francisco where a thousand people um, got to travel to Mount Everest, and of course the 5,500 people at X Games. 
and each kit came with nine experiences. So you could create a VR lounge that would allow people to travel anywhere they wanted to go. Um, we had just announced our first partnership with the National Museum of Australia for Expedition 360 um, to launch a pop-up uh, ex experience in places besides National Geographic headquarters. And one of the last things I was working on before COVID swept through um, Washington, DC, was working with Erica Woolsey, who is the CEO of the Hydrus, um, to create a museum exhibition experience that would be focused on the show that we created together called Manta Ray Eden. So Erica was standing in the historic home of National Geographic, the 100 plus year old uh, Halbert Hall, and welcoming people to go on an adventure with her diving with manta rays. So uh, thank you. This is, I'm sure we'll have much more to talk about in the discussion. And if you have any questions and want to follow up, all my information is right there. And you can explore the treehouse at meridiantreehouse.com.